welcome learners today we are going to talk about uh, the perspectives relating to multidisciplinary education and also how it is going to affect our learning space for me i am currently working as director of this institute which you could see from this uh, visual and uh, this was one of the first uh, inter university center to look at uh, the fundamental question that what is the building block of matter so this is uh, one such center which started uh, exploring the possibilities in nuclear sciences but later on we realized that this can be used for uh, multi dimensional aspects and now the name of this uh, center is uh, changed to inter university accelerator center so when i talk about uh, the evolution of indian higher education if you go back to the 5th or 6th century to 5th century ad there was a takshila and this takshila was established in gandhar which is now in pakistan the vedas and also the 18 arts which included skills such as archery hunting and elephant lore they were taught in these uh, school of learnings law schools medical school and school of military science the ayurvedic healer charak he studied at takshila arthashastra by chanakya kautilya was also composed at uh, takshila it is not me but you can see it uh, from wikipedia the university of nalanda which was uh, during the 5th century to 12th century in india it has the greatest achievement of ancient period in the field of education it was one of the world's first residential universities and about 10000 students 2000 teachers they were on the campus and the faculty student ratio is unimaginable it was 1x to 5 the library was a nine storied building and the meticulous copies of texts were produced and preserved in this library student in those days they studied science astronomy medicine and logic as diligently as they applied themselves to metaphysics philosophy sankhya yoga shastra the vedas and the scriptures of buddhism likewise they also studied the foreign policy philosophy transcending the ethnic and national boundaries and because of that that seat of learning attracted peoples and scholars from korea japan china tibet indonesia persia turkey and other parts of the globe nalanda represent the concept of university of the ancient period and somehow we missed very recently when uh, we started uh, setting up the modern universities after a large gap of 600 years when this uh, nalanda university was destroyed or you can say after the university of bologna in italy in uh, 1088 after 769 years we started setting up uh, the seat of learnings the modern universities bombay calcutta madras and they were all founded in 1857 and then the fourth modern university university of allahabad it was set up in 1887 and i am proud uh, alumnus of this university which was uh, known as uh, oxford of the east these universities they began as a purely examining bodies and the territorial jurisdiction extended to large number of territory and uh, later on indian universities commission was appointed in 1902 and the indian universities act was passed in 1904 for example university of allahabad it was under central governance then it became state university and again it has been reincorporated at central university when we talk about a good university so good university means teaching takes place we teach in a good university but a great university transforms the entire society the psyche of a student in because of that the good university only produces graduates whereas the great university produces leaders of all walks of life so the quality culture and adaptability should should be an attempt to answer to the question of competitiveness in higher education 
for which we have started uh, working again and this new education policy 2020 talks about many such things and I will be talking only about multidisciplinary education, how we can have uh, multiple entry and exit to the different programs. Before that, why this multidisciplinarity is important, I will let you know that uh, this is called a dawn of knowledge era in which the science and technology has developed in such a manner that uh, we can see the unparalleled economic growth because of which there is a globalization, there is a competition, innovation and also simultaneously you can see uncontrolled exploitation of Earth's resources. This 21st century is the century of knowledge and the process of transition is not stopped, it's still going on. So whatever we did in 20th, 20th century, it was because we had a unprecedented gain in advancing human development, industrial growth and eradication of poverty in certain regions of the world and we can attribute all these developments, all these progresses because of technological breakthrough. But I will let you know why this uh, role of uh, science and technology need to be recalibrated at this juncture when we are ushering to the new era. The reason being the foremost reason is that uh, the progress in science has been for the most part insular, monolithic and unitary. Why it is unitary, why it is monolithic? Because it has uh, progressed in a exponential rate and that rate is about 7% per annum. Every 10 to 15 years it doubles and every half a century you can see a factor of 10 by which it develops. In last 300 years, you can see that it has uh, developed a million times more. And if I compare with the evolution of society, that domain is 10,000 years. So you can always notice there is a phase lag. Science and technology has developed, has evolved at a very faster pace, whereas the societal evolution has remained almost stagnant, but uh, this phase lag has resulted into many anomalies. So when we say that scientific revolution has outpaced the social revolution, not only for a few years, but over a century now, because of that you can see many issues which are now bothering you. Maybe it is uh, environment, energy, health, natural hazards, the species are getting extinct, the unsustainability which is in your consumption and also because all these things you can see that inequalities are growing, the gap between haves, have-nots, those who know, those who don't know, that gap is growing and there is a divide which did not come into sharper focus soon enough. And because of that, our, the paradox of our time is that, that despite the fact that we have spectacularly advanced in science and technology, the economic progress is unprecedented, we have improved in the quality of life, the inequalities which have grown up because of which the knowledge divide is there, and because of that you can see many of the part of the world is troubled. On the other side, Without mining the scarce resources, we have uh, started consuming at a faster rate because of which the resources are depleting and the planet, the earth planet is at a stress. And in the, very recently, this IPCC that was, uh, uh, that recognized the climate change because of anthropogenic, acti anthropogenic activities and uh, for which Nobel Prize was shared by IPCC and Al Gore, just to highlight that uh, this unsustainability of our activities, which are because of our activities, human activities, the climate change is inevitable and it is going to bring many catastrophic changes in the society. This is one such example. If you visit any part of the country, you will find the water bodies which are at distress 
none of the water bodies, the rivers, they are in the pure state of the form. And because of overconsumption, they have become unsustainable. Many of the cities across the world, even Delhi, that becomes gas chamber. It is difficult to survive in those days when the, the, the humidity and also this uh, fume, the gas exhausts keep people bothered. The air quality becomes poorer and sometimes it also helps many such problems which are due to this. So what we call these are the effluents of the effluent. What we can do without using the single use of plastics, we are using without knowing how this is going to affect the environmental pollution, how the environment is going to get degraded. And very recently, you might have also come to know that uh, there was a foam which was uh, floating when uh, Eastern India people, they wanted to have a festival in Yamuna. So Yamuna was converted in a, in a, in a, in a different, like we, we, we used to say it is foam filled with the foam. And many of the uh, rivers, for example, Varanasi, is uh, known because there are two rivers, Varuna and Assi. Assi river is uh, almost uh, converted as a Nala. So that is another issue which is uh, bothering you and we have to be mindful. The other important thing is the health and human being, they are affected because of uh, epidemics, because of uh, several terminal diseases and because of uh, the quality of life. The aging population is uh, on the higher side but we are not able to sustain their activities. And this is one such uh, area in which we need to worry, and that is many of the species, they are getting extinct. So why this is happening, we need to look at this part. And because of that, we have to have the phase lag, which is there between uh, societal lag and also societal evolution, and also the technological development need to be minimized to make people understand that uh, we have to work for the sustainability of the, this earth. Another important dimension which has been added is because of the shrinking time domains. Way back in 1830 when Faraday discovered about the Faraday's law, it took more than 50 years to get it uh, implemented in terms of some kind of technology, electricity. The DNA model which was proposed by Watson Crick 20 years took for genetic engineering to take uh, forward. Very recently, when carbon nanotube by Ijima came in 1991, within 10 years, it got implemented in logic circuits. So what you, you can notice that uh, in the last 30 years, and if you compare the last 15 years, 5,000 years, the last 30 years are the years which have generated more new information as compared to the previous 5,000 years. So that is another area in which the time domain has shrunk. And you could see the number of uh, different revolutions which, which took place when uh, mechanical production started the uh, first industrial revolution, then second industrial revolution, then the third industrial revolution. And now we are at the brink of the fourth industrial revolution, which is uh, based on cyber physical systems. So at the end of the 18th century, this uh, industrial revolution 1, 1.0 came. Beginning of the century, this, uh, this 2.0, 70s, 3.0, today it is 4.0, and the complexity level is increasing. The other important thing is that uh, when we started working with the basic telephone, it took uh, 75 years to reach 200 million customers, but uh, the games which are coming, the online activities which are going in one month, we can reach to 100 million customers. So that is another shrinking the domain. And uh, for this, the changes which are there due to the fourth industrial revolution, we need to have uh, different kind of employability skills. So these skills are necessary to survive in uh, 21st century because the trouble which is there, the troubled world because of this knowledge gap, because of the galloping consumption. So the violence and terror, changing skill sets, the employability requirements, lifelong learning necessity, 
changing the learner profile, be it uh, family structure from uh, joint family to nuclear families to lo large number of uh, demographic dividend, which is due to which, which gives you the adolescent concerns, and also the growth of uh, knowledge, which I have just exemplified, the changed work environment, people have become tech savvy. We have to look at different ways by which we, we can access information and also assessment can be done and that necessitates the changes in our, our uh, curriculum or pedagogy. We are uh, also requiring different kind of uh, thinking skills. It was not only rote learning which was uh, predominantly utilized by the learners. We have to experiment, we have to compare, we have to invent, we have to go for critic kicking, we have to go for interrogating, we have to go for judging. So these are some of the higher order thinking skills which uh, need to be worked out. And uh, you could see the earlier uh, pedagogy heavily relied on the lower level of competencies. That was remembering, understanding, applying. So they were the lowest level of competencies. But in coming days, when we talk about uh, the new higher thinking skills, we need to know about uh, how we can analyze, how we can evaluate, how we can create. Creativity should be there. And because of that, we need to change in the assessment forms. And uh, for that, the focus in the new age science is not only addressing human needs and concerns, but also there are many opportunities which are described in form of UN, UN Millennium Development Goals, for example, hunger, health, education, environment that are linked with the global change research programs, that is climate change, energy issues. So the education system should be geared up to take the challenges so that this Millennium Development Goals can be attained. If you talk about uh, human rights, human rights co is composed of five such rights, civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights, cultural rights. The upper half, civil rights and political rights are guaranteed to some extent, but uh, the three other rights, which are the lower uh, side which in this uh, view, viewgram, economic rights, social rights, and cultural rights, they are neglected half of the human rights. And to work uh, with the human rights fully, we need to recognize these rights. And for that, we have to deal with the sphere of human beings working, their producing, their servicing, how we are going to improve their standard of living, the quality of life, not for one person, but all the persons. And also, how we can deal with the cultural rights in terms of uh, cultural sphere of life, including ethnic culture, subcultures, arts, and science. So these uh, neglected half of human rights, they are again depicted in unfinished MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, which can be classified as social, economic, and environmental. You can have this no poverty. These are the 17 Millennium, millennium Goals. Zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation. If uh, it is uh, economic SDGs, then affordable and clean energy, recent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and sustainable consumption and production. Environment SDGs are also important very much important. They are climate action, life below water, life on land, whereas 16th and 17th goals are the means of implementation of these SDGs. Now the question arises, what can science do? In the 21st century, we have to have a more inclusive view of science. It should not be insular, it should not be monolithic, it should not be unitary. And uh, the conception that science is autonomous, is now considered as unsustainable. So if we do not uh, remove the phase lag between societal evolution and also the technology development, we are going to be faced with the several sustainability issues. So the new role of science talks about innovation by talking to 
other streams of knowledge is with the science, keeping view the sustainable development part for which we have to innovate. And for innovation, we require higher thinking skills, which was missing in our sets of skills when we were simply focusing on remembering, understanding, and applying some of the things. Now, the science needs to shed its splendid isolation. And for that, the societal engagement is required with the science. The policy linkage should be there, for which again innovation is required. So we need to have a synergy between scientific and societal progress. And that helps both science as well as society. Why? In science, we get values, different methods to deal with, and different products which are sustainable. On the other side, unless otherwise society accepts the developments of the science and technology, it is equitably distributed. And also it also keeps in mind that unless otherwise it is sustainable, we are not going to use those products or we have to minimum minimize the uses. Then both science and society cohabit with each other. And because of that, the science becomes responsible, transparent, and understand the full implications of new discoveries in the context of moral and ethical values and sustainability of our planet, whereas society sheds its cynicism and skepticism about science and recognizes its centrality for human good. So that means the compartmentalization of our education system in which those who used to study only science or even in the sciences, the branches were uh, divided into biological science, life sciences, or mathematical science, or physical sciences, they were not talking to each other. And the problem, or the real problem, the solution of these real problems lie at the interface of many disciplines. It is not limited to only one discipline for which we need to train a particular segment of the society or the student by simply giving some knowledge about uh, the know-how or uh, giving the technical know-how to understand the technique and apply the technique for uh, just for the sake of applying the technique. Instead, we should have a good appreciation that where several such techniques will be required by which we can actually solve the real problem and find out the problem which are need needed for the sustainable development of our country. Another important thing is that if you look at uh, the past percentage and also the learning outcome, if you are good at understanding, the chances of failure will be minimum. If uh, you don't understand, definitely the student has, is going to fail the examination. On the other side, uh, this quadrant also gives you a kind of uh, feeling that if you know better, if you have a good understanding, you will pass the examination. So on top, uh, both the things are same. Like uh, if you understand better, the chances of failure will be minimum, and chances of passing will also be reasonably good. But why I am uh, concerned about the fourth quadrant, and that is uh, I'm being modest, that poor understanding is there, but the people are passing the examination. And that number is not less number. That is also a sizable number of people who, without understanding, they write the examination and they get uh, the pass certificate. So that is a matter of concern for all of us. And unless otherwise, we ensure that uh, the student has understood or the learning outcomes are achieved, this will be a simple example of getting some kind of certificate without knowing much. To handle those issues which have just uh, summarized the new education policy has uh, come forward with a new vision, and that vision is nothing other than the Takshila, the Nalanda vision. When we had all these things, that this policy is talking about uh, holistic education, the futuristic education, the flexibility in our uh, system that gives you value-based quality higher education promoting access, equity, affordability, accountability, and also on top of that quality. Everything is required for developing good, thoughtful, well-rounded, and creative individuals by enabling them to develop their character, ethical and constitutional values, intellectual curiosity, 
scientific temper, creativity, and spirit of service. So, if these are the attributes which are there, then only we can think that our education system has resulted into a student who is a good human being and can be considered as global citizen. So, the concept of Vasudhaya Kutumbakam is only possible if we have well-rounded individuals who are trained for their values, for their uh, all-round development, with having all kind of intellectual curiosity, and that is what is needed out of this system.